where is U.S. economic growth actually heading? And are we finally in a space here where perhaps we can rejoice in that it is heading to a place where the Fed won't need to raise rates again, and the markets can hope that maybe, just maybe, there's even a bit of stimulus coming down the pipe, or are we still looking at a buoyant U.S. economy whereby the Fed is going to have to continue to keep rates at these restrictive levels and squeezing growth? That's the, the question that we ask ourselves here uh, on Macro Money Today. Uh, this is Ilya Spivak, Head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. As ever, welcome to the show. If you're watching this on YouTube, feel free. And indeed, I encourage you to jump into the comments, uh, leave your thoughts. Where do you think the U.S. economy is going? What do you think the Fed is going to do about it? What do you think it's going to mean for markets? Um, all of your thoughts, of course, welcome. Uh, and we will uh, incorporate them into the show going forward. Now, as we look at what is going to inform this narrative this week, uh, let's um, first of all get a sense of where we are and what has been going on, uh, and then we'll try to piece together what all of it might mean uh, as uh, we get the event risk that's with us this time around. Uh, we, of course, are going to look at this from a trading perspective. And, and so we're less so interested, as it were, in where the actual growth picture is taking us, and more so interested in how the market is going to react to whatever that is. So we begin, not surprisingly, with the September 20th FOMC, which was a key touch point in markets and uh, was clearly something that unnerved investors because the Fed essentially told the markets that it is going to need rates higher than markets uh, were previously anticipating and then the Fed was previously anticipating back when it um, had this forecasting done in the earlier iteration in June because growth was going to be stronger. So if we look at these expectations, stronger growth this year, June versus September, next year, likewise, rates that hold up near the current levels through the rest of this year, and higher rates next year than previously expected, to the tune of about 50 basis points. Markets, needless to say, don't like this. They look at uh, economic uh, growth around the world slowing to a trickle, uh, and they say, well, the one singular point of help here is the Fed. Getting fiscal authorities to coordinate some kind of a counter-cyclical response to this slowdown is probably not in the cards. We are probably going to have a hard time coordinating something like that, even just in the U.S., never mind internationally. Meanwhile, the Fed, as we've said many times here before, is the driver of borrowing costs all across the world, not just in the U.S., because what it's manipulating is the borrowing cost of U.S. dollars, the quintessential medium of exchange for nearly all of global commerce. So when the Fed makes borrowing dollars more expensive, it's making borrowing more expensive for everything and for everyone, nearly everywhere, with maybe the possible uh, exception of a place like North Korea, which is virtually disconnected from the global financial system. So not surprisingly, the markets say, okay, well, this is going to be 50 basis points more expensive to finance any kind of economic activity anywhere. This is not good. We'd like for the Fed, this sort of singular competency actor that can g give us a hand directly to be going the other way. And so the result you get in markets is a push out in uncertainty. So we can see here the markets don't end up expecting that the Fed is going to do any more hikes. So the front end of the yield curve, the two-year yield here in the green, that holds. Meanwhile, the long end goes higher. And as we've now heard from various Fed officials, including 
Jay Powell himself, the main driver of this has been a rise in term premium, which is essentially an increase in the perception of risk lending over a longer period of time. In other words, if I'm going to lend to someone over two days, I am less worried that that uh, someone is going to not pay back than if I lend for 10 years. Lots more can go wrong in 10 years. And if I'm relatively confident in the economic environment, then maybe I'm not so worried about a longer uh, t uh, period of time elapsing. But if the world is more uncertain, if rates are higher at a time that inflation is starting to subside, but perhaps not to central banks' pleasure, but global growth is already recessionary tending, then I am indeed concerned about what might happen as time elapses. And so what we, what we see here is this surge in the long end of the yield curve, not because uh, of uh, anything particularly positive, but rather because there is greater demand for compensation for taking time risk, for taking duration risk in lending. And so this seems to speak to the markets being sort of generally unnerved. In, in fact, we can see that this duration uh, fear really started around late July and reached a powerful crescendo here with what the Fed was saying. This is the first time that we've had a positive term premium on a 10-year treasury bonds in years. And so as we look at the impact of this, we can clearly see how the markets have responded. They very pointedly do not like what they are seeing here. So from late July, the same spot where the, the shift in term premium begins, we see that as the scope for cuts through the rest of this year and next narrows, the gray bars are the difference in rates now versus the end of next year, which includes the last two Fed meetings of this year, November and December, and all of next, we can see that scope for rate cuts has diminished, which is another way of saying term premium has increased, uh, from about 175 basis points in cuts over this period to about 100 basis points less than that, so closer to 75, maybe even 50. And so what we then end up seeing, especially reaching a fever pitch with the Fed's uh, announcement last month, is a decline in stocks around all of this, pointing to the market's sensitivity and suggesting that what investors really care about here as it pertains to U.S. growth is less so is it more growth, is it less growth, and more so, is whatever happening going to be something that brings Fed rate uh, cuts closer or delays them further? And of course, an interesting bit in this entire story is we had uh, a very closely watched speech from Fed Chair uh, Powell last week. He, he was at the Economic Club of New York, and he's saying that essentially what this has done, what this shift in rates has done is effectively given the Fed the 50 basis points that it wanted to achieve here without them having to do it. That essentially rate hikes are probably done now, and this rise in yields, thanks to the swelling of term premium, has already delivered the tightening that the Fed was after here, and so perhaps they don't need to hike further. Perhaps this is already done. And what we can, of course, see here is this has put in a bit of a tepid bottom in the stock market, at least for the moment, which, of course, brings us to what we are facing in this week ahead. And we start with the first kind of glimpse at U.S. growth by way of Canada. Now, the policy announcement here not expected to uh, bring any 
changes the bank of canada with only a 5.6 percent uh, uh, chance here of a rate hike at this meeting and as we look down all the way out to september of next year no meaningful probability of any change in policy all these numbers here uh, we can see under 50 percent uh, chance one way or another not until september of next year do we have a better than even uh, probability of any change in anything and that's a 67 percent uh, chance of a cut by that meeting and we can see that it starts to escalate come mid-year so by june a 20 percent chance of a cut july 35 september 34 and as we sort of start to add these up cumulatively from march down is where we see these negative numbers occur that starts to give us a cumulative 67 percent probability that by september there's a cut with standstill in the meantime looking at the longer kind of catch-all view here we see that we have standstill basically until a year from now and by that time is where we get the first cut so perhaps in uh october of next year is when the first bit of easing actually arrives now why this is important for u.s growth and fed policy considerations is of course canada's economy is attached to that of the U.S. with very, very significant spillover and very significant dependency. In fact, looking at the second quarter GDP numbers here, we can see that domestic demand actually grew in Canada in the second quarter, but external demand fell more, and so GDP ended up shrinking, showing us just how sensitive Canada's economy is to what happens across its southern border because indeed what is external demand in canada well looking at the share of um, u.s shipments in its overall exports we're talking about anything between 65 and 85 percent over the recent decades most recently 78 percent so the picture here as we look at what this second quarter gdp number ultimately means is a weakening of U.S. demand, it seems. Because if external demand is, is what's driving this down, and most of that are shipments to the U.S., well, then we know the culprit. Since the second quarter, things have not meaningfully improved. Here's Canada's exports, um, and we can see that they've been shrinking in year-on-year -year terms now for five months straight. Now, the pace of contraction has uh, eased a little bit, as we can see, over the past two or three months or so. But nevertheless, the shrinking continues. What's more, if we look at just how anemic Canadian manufacturing PMI is, and the manufacturing sector is, of course, ground zero for U.S. demand. This is the U.S.'s uh, supply uh, chain's uh, really on display here uh clearly this is uh, the u.s auto sector and various other of course uh, value add uh value add centers for manufacturing really serving the u.s market here and as we can see not only is this pmi reading well under the 50 level so we're very much contracting in canada's manufacturing sector we are likewise uh, shrinking at an accelerated rate. So the, the past two months have given us the fastest pace of contraction since 2020, which is telling us that this is uh, about as bad of a, of, a, of a set of conditions for Canadian manufacturing and therefore about as bad of a view on U.S. demand as we had in the early months of the COVID pandemic. Not exactly encouraging. What we also see is that in tandem with this cool off, there is a, a climb down in inflation expectations. So we see here that chances are the third quarter looks quite a bit like the second in that external demand looks anemic and that this is pulling down 
inflation expectations with about a month long lag. So uh, this is the five year break even. That's the bond market's um, implied inflation expectation as priced in uh, over the coming five years and or in five years. And we can see that the markets are recognizing that this weakness in U.S. demand as it presents itself in Canada also means that inflation in Canada is likely to continue to head lower, giving the BOC room here to sit on its hands. So ostensibly, the message from the BOC here will suggest that with waning U.S. demand and with that being reflected in what's going on in Canada, there's probably no reason for them to tighten, but by extension, there's probably not a reason for the Fed to hold higher for longer than the markets already envision, at least on the basis of this set of information. The following day, we're going to get a more direct view. The first look at U.S. third quarter GDP is going to uh, come out here, and the expectation is that we're actually going to have quite uh, a robust pickup. So looking at uh, the expectations here, 4.5% expected uh, for the year uh, or for the annualized quarterly rate, that's up from 2.1%, quite the jump. And so the question then naturally becomes, well, is this now too backward looking? This, of course, is the third quarter, so um, the three months ending uh, September. But, of course, we've also now seen the PMI data for uh, all of that uh, period and earlier today for October, suggesting that growth is much more circumspect and, indeed, that uh, economic activity conditions actually slowed between the second and the third quarter uh, when we look at a more forward-looking set of indicators. So take that and couple it with ostensibly a downbeat Bank of Canada giving us a view of U.S. demand that's far less forgiving, and these numbers start looking stale. But even if they don't, with such a heady jump expected, it seems unlikely that we get anything that moves the needle for the Fed because you would ostensibly need to print significantly better than this 4.5% jump, already a rosy number, to get the markets anything that would have them rethinking Fed policy expectations as they stand. That this is already the forecast means it's in the price. It would need to be significantly better to get the markets thinking, well, actually, this this GDP number is so good that we need to perhaps see Fed rate hikes um, recur here or at the very least see rate cuts delayed further than we now think. The bar seems pretty high to something like that, even if we take these numbers at face value before thinking that perhaps they are a bit stale. So with that in mind, we have a back-to-back -back sequence here between the Bank of Canada and the GDP numbers that seem to suggest that at the very least, the calculus for markets in their focus on Fed policy expectations isn't going to get materially worse, most likely, because whatever we get out of these indicators probably doesn't move the needle in a way that suggests the Fed is going to have to be higher for longer than is already anticipated. That, of course, uh, comports with uh, the indications we've seen in this uh, JP Morgan index of Fed speak. Uh, this is... Um, measuring uh, essentially the tone of speeches outside of regular policy announcements by Fed officials and uh, assigns a score to hawkish versus dovish versus neutral and tallies all that up. And so we can see here that the general tone in Fed speak has conspicuously 
cooled since that September 20th FOMC, where the, the Fed ostensibly gave us that signal that we're going to need rates 50 basis points higher. This gives credence to the idea that indeed we have a situation where the Fed feels the market has done its heavy lifting and that we are at this point ready to pause. Looking at what that pause looks like, we can see here the first cut appears in the forecast no later than July. It's fully priced in there. So we can see here down one. So that's the down one 25 basis point move here and a 21% chance for a further cut. That further cut is fully priced in by the time we get uh, to November. And then there is a 76% uh, chance of a third cut by December, which then is fully baked in come January. So we're looking for rates to shed back down uh, to about 4.5% come January of next year. And so the question then becomes, with this Bank of Canada announcement probably striking a gloomy tone, and with the GDP number, at the very least, establishing a high bar on anything that would delay rate cuts further. The central message that the markets end up with is, well, things are not wonderful, but they're not worse than expected. And to the extent that the GDP number underwhelms, because maybe it isn't quite so robust, especially in a context of a Bank of Canada that's very clearly painting a picture, if it does, of uh, things deteriorating after the reporting period for that GDP number elapses, well, then you start to get the sense that maybe actually surprise risk is tilted the other way. Maybe conviction in rate uh, cuts uh, grows, and maybe it actually even sees them nudge back up into June territory. Right now, the likelihood of a cut in June at 65%, so significant. Maybe that gets closer to 70 or 80. And with the markets minded as they are, that's probably a good thing for stocks and probably a bad thing for the U.S. dollar. Because what it might do is put this very dynamic that we see here in reverse, at least for the time being. And so even as we get this downbeat data, even as uh, out of Canada, and even as the GDP number seems like it might be too little too late here, or, or at least a setting of the bar so high that it's difficult to clear with gusto, maybe the markets actually end up saying, well, actually, this is a good thing. Because what this means is our reprieve is closer on the horizon. And that is macro money for today. Uh, as ever, we are here Monday through Thursday, right after Overtime, a show I co-host with Chris Vecchio, head of Futures and Forex here at Tasty Live, as well as uh, increasingly Dylan Radigan. Um, I'm on with Chris again for Futures Power Hour on Fridays, on with Tom and Tony for First Call on Sundays, writing for the News and Insights section of TastyLive.com, and opining on the platform formerly known as Twitter, at Ilya Spivak. Thanks very much for joining. Good luck out there. Macromani will see you tomorrow. Take care.